You may be seated for the reading of the scriptures. Good morning. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 7 and 12 through 18. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warrior cries aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast, and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed. For a full, a terrible end, he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Reading from 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Concerning the times and the season, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and there will be no escape. But you, my beloved, are not in darkness. For that day to you, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us not fall asleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. For those who are drunk, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. And put on the breastplate of faith and love, and a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. And I love this. I mean, sometimes we can focus on things that are irrelevant. And it's irrelevant whether he's coming when he's coming, where he's coming, what we're doing, it's irrelevant. 
Because the thing is, we're in him. And light burns up the darkness. So any darkness that is in me, if I am in him, it will be burned up. And so my hope is not in, I know this, or I know that, or I can predict when he's coming. My hope is that I'm with him. I'm in him. He's through me. And that is my hope. So I'm sober in the fact that he is doing this work in me, that I am relentless. It says the kingdom of God is within you. It also says that the kingdom suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Are you violently pursuing the kingdom? Are you violently renting yourself of those things that keep you from the fire, that keep you from the light? Be sober. Be willing. Be like those that went to the lion's den and were singing and rejoicing. They weren't crazy. Their hope was in God. They knew what awaited them. And to know him in the power of his resurrection is more than we can fathom. It's greater than any money. It's greater than any security we can experience in this life because we are not of this world, but we are in him. This is the word of the Lord. Grace and peace be with you all. Once again, Christ is reappearing, manifesting himself through his word in our presence as we've gathered in agreement to hear him preach to us through the gospel reading. Jesus said, for it is, as, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Now I'm going to read that in Western modern terms for you. The kingdom of God is as if a man was going on a journey, summoned his slaves, and entrusted them his property. Then he gave $25 million to one. To another, he gave $10 million. And to one, he gave $5 million. It's unbelievable when you look at what a talent was in those days. Jesus is saying this is how extravagant the kingdom is. We're talking in millions. 6,000 denarii. That's 30,000 times one day's wage. See, what Deaconess read, our perception's messed up because we want God to fix our natural world rather than have us see his kingdom on earth. So he says, this is what the kingdom is like. It's like economy. It's like an economy, all right? The one that had received five talents, or 25 million, went at once and traded with them and made 25 million more. <laughs> In the same way, the one who had two talents, or 10 million, made another 10 million. But the one who had received just the five million, or the one who thought he had less than everybody else, the one who thought he didn't get the right amount and was kind of in self-pity with his five million, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled, did some accounting work with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing another 25 million, saying, Master, you handed over to me 25 million. Here's 25 million more. Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in just a few things. I will put you in charge of many things now. 
because you can reproduce what I gave you. So now you can have more because you're not still surviving with what I gave you. And the one who had 10 million also came forward saying, Master, you handed me $10 million. See, I've made 10 million more for you. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Now, if 10 million and 25 million is just a little to God, what is a lot to God? Then the one who had received 5 million also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. I took it out of circulation. I went into isolation. I began to worry and calculate the future. I started listening to the prognosticators in the economy and in politics. I started worrying about when the end's going to come. I started thinking what's going to happen a year from now, two years now, ten years. I can't even perceive the blessing you've given me because I'm so focused on something outside of the present moment. That's right. I'm just obsessed with retirement. I'm obsessed with what I'm going to do in my old age. So your five million did me absolutely no good. Too much is given, even more will be asked. Well, if I could just win the lottery, you'll do with the lottery what you're doing with the 10 bucks you have now. That's right. If you're spending it on drugs, you'll buy more drugs with with a million. That's right. (laughs) Whatever you're doing with a little is what you'll do with a bunch. Amen. Amen. Well, this this is the Lord speaking now. Under the power of the Spirit. He said, I was afraid and I went and hid your talent. I I put it in a place that was safe. I kept it safe. Because safety to me is everything. Security and safety is what I live for. I'm obsessed with safety and security. I'm obsessed with knowing I'm going to be okay in the future. Come on. No fear. I am obsessed with the fear of being abandoned. That's right. Come on. So I cannot trust you, God. So I've got to work myself to the bone emotionally to feel what is called artificial intimacy with you. Come on, Bishop. Artificial, artificial intimacy. Intimacy around things and doing things and being placed. Oh, we all say, does the Holy Ghost move in the in liturgical church? Does the Holy Ghost move in liturgy? He's moving now. I'm obsessed with protecting everything in the natural for fear that I'll be abandoned if I don't have it. Come on. Now, the other two who were not obsessed with safety multiplied what God had already given them. So the problem isn't whether you have it, it's whether you're obsessed with it. Come on. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. See, I, I don't buy this gospel that says money's evil and We're talking, Jesus is saying right here, this isn't about your natural talent. You can sing, you can do accounting, you can build stuff. This is about money. That's right. (laughs) Where your treasure is, your heart will be. This is about your money, honey. 
Now, anyway, let's read on. He says, I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my economy or money with the bankers and my return I would have received what is my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away from them. So they'll have to invent a gospel that says poverty is a badge of spiritual honor. Thank you for all those amens on that one. And for this worthless slave, this unproductive, lazy, entitlement, welfare-minded person who thinks his money's safe if he stuffs it under his mattress or hides it in a wall, or saves it up so that they can lose it all to Enron and Madoff. <laughs> True. We're going to get through this eventually, Father. We'll be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Heavenly Father, illuminate us, enlighten us, help us digest your word outside of secular humanism and embrace it in sacred truth. In Jesus' name we pray, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My message this morning is stop hiding, stop stuffing your money in the mattress. Turn to somebody and say, stop stuffing your money in the mattress. No, people actually lose their peace over money. They go all kinds of different directions. Marriages are messed up because of money. Ministries, people leave churches because they ask for money. And to all of those that have criticized any ministry for asking for money, I have one thing to say for you. Get over it, because it just reveals your own deficiency. <laughs> it reveals where your heart really is. Because it isn't about the money, it's about your heart. Hoarding is a disease. They've actually made shows about it now, reality shows about hoarders. These people are obsessed with holding on to what they already have out of fear of the future. They have to bring psychiatrists and psychologists in to heal them of this problem. Because we were not designed to hoard. We were designed to give. 
we were designed to serve. Oh, we, see, here's, see, a person who hoards his money will also hoard his time. People who are obsessed with financial security have a type of demonic possession. Or at least oppressed by demons. I love the two scriptures that were read by, by this morning by uh, Elder Hoover and, De- and uh, Deaconess. Because the Lord said the problem is darkness comes to those who are obsessed. Whose perception are, is wrong. People who, you know, the, the world looks different to somebody who's paranoid. The world looks different to someone who puts their trust in the natural world and natural things than it does to someone whose trust is in God. The world, you cannot even have a good conversation with a carnally obsessed person if you're trying to talk about God. Because a carnally possessed person is obsessed with Artificial security and artificial intimacy. This is why marriages break up, because their, wor- their world is built around artificial intimacy. Uh, intimacy based on tasks and possessions. See, if your marriage is centered around your children, you have an artificial intimacy. Not true intimacy. Intimacy. But if the vision for our lives is not channeling God's gift through us, but retaining God's gift for our own natural security, we want to serve God because we want to use God's principles to enhance our natural security and preserve our lives and protect our lives. This is why Christianity doesn't fly big in the West. Because in the West, it's all about performance. See, God is not a policeman. God is not a policeman. But he is an accountant. He makes account of things. He assesses things. Talents are not about natural abilities, but rather about economy. Today's gospel is more to do with how we allow the life of God to flow through us or how we allow it not to flow through us because it is powerful like money. The life of God here, Jesus says, I'm going to show you the kingdom's life. It has power like money. The Holy Spirit, the life of God has power like money. It can get you through doors people without money can't get into. See, sometimes you go to a restaurant and they say, we're sorry, we're booked up. But if you can pull out enough money, they'll find a table fast. That's how the kingdom of God is. Oh, come on here. Sometimes you can't get a good seat in the theater. But if you can pull out enough money, they'll bring you to the front of the line and bring you in. That's how the kingdom of God is. When you let the life of God flow through you, you can walk through doors that carnally minded people cannot walk through. You can stretch. See, hoarding is an affection with what used to provide. What used to provide, or at least in a false sense, used to provide me security and value. And so God forbid that I would abandon myself from something that once was and let the life of God flow in me to be something new or to do something new or to think new. See, I I really believe this. Once we understand what the kingdom of God is like, We fool ourselves. We come here and we worship, and we go back and we do everything secularly. And then ask God to bless us, because even our prayers are jacked up. 
excuse my raw street language, but I think I'll go there. See, there's only one prayer you should pray for you. Only one prayer. It's three words, Lord have mercy. That's the only prayer you need to pray for you. No other prayer should you ever breathe to God. If you trust God, you don't have to pray to God for things. You just have to thank God for his mercy. I'm going to go somewhere now because we'll pray God uh, fix our finances and God's like, I can't hear a thing. I hear noise down there. I told you it's going to be a strange message because if you're carnally minded, you're going to miss the whole message. You're going to think I'm talking about money. I'm saying the kingdom of God is like money. But the way we view money has a lot to do with the way we think spiritually. Because money is energy, it is spirit. And, and see, I hear all the time, well, if God would just bless me with a bunch of money, I could do a lot for God. And God's like, <laughs> that says, if you're not letting my life, the life of my spirit flow through you now, no amount of money is going to change what you can do. See, we all want to believe God for a bunch of money because we think we would better steward it for his work than the person sitting next to us. But here's, here's the answer to that question. If you're not letting the life of God flow you through you now, money isn't going isn't to fix that. And I'm anti-anti-money. <laughs> People have this hang-up about money, have a hang-up with the life of God. Because God invented economy. But he did invent it to enhance carnal security. He, in that, he invented it to make connections. The money in your bank account right now, the money in your pocket right now, is not for your security. It's to make connections with people. I told you I was going to preach a strange message today because I keep asking God, show me the kingdom. You know what? I, I can tell you someone who's wealthy, someone who has a lot of connections. Somebody who can rub shoulders with all kinds of people because God entrusts wealth to people who are motivated by connections. And I will say this, read my lips very clearly because I'm going to say, thus saith the Lord. If you're in isolation as a person or as a family or as a community, if you're in isolation, which means you're just around what you're comfortable with, you're in poverty. I don't care how nice a car you think you have or how nice a house you think you have or how nice a clothes you can buy. If you're in isolation, living with artificial intimacy, you are in spiritual poverty. And then what you'll have to do is criticize organized religion. Because you want disorganized religion. Jesus uses, he talks more about money than he talks about hell. <laughs> For a reason. Because money synonymizes itself or is equal to or it equalizes itself with responsibility, accountability, and stewardship. See, we're called to be stewards of the gift of God in us. Every person in this room, every person watching over the web, every person who listens to this audio tape, there's far more than $25 million worth of value in the gift of God inside of you. I can prove it. Get sick and go to the hospital and see how much they charge to make you well. That'll tell you how valuable life is. Are you with me today? Talents are not about natural abilities, but rather economy. 
Today's gospel has more to do with how we allow the life of God to flow through us because it is powerful like money. It's like oil last week in the parable. It's like a lamp with oil. You've got to have something to burn if you want light. There's the sting of the parable. The person who refused to let the money work or refused to let the life of God work identifies his fears. Not letting it work identifies what you're afraid of. I gotta, I gotta slow down here. Not letting the life of God work in you identifies what you're afraid of. But we've not been given a spirit of fear or of timidity, but of sound mind, peace, power, and love. This is far, this parable, this preaching of this parable, not me, the preaching of this parable, is far more valuable than anything Tony Robbins can preach about success. Because it gets down to the heart of the matter. What's revealing your fears? It's easy to believe in God, but it's another thing to trust God. I believe in a lot of things I don't trust. But to trust God, in God's eyes, is more important than even believing in him. Do you trust God? How big is God to you? You find out how big God is by where your fears are at. In other words... Is God big enough to fix the issue without you controlling it? Maybe you're supposed to stay in this difficulty and bear the weight of the difficulty and wait for the difficulty so that your character and your economy can multiply a harvest. It's not trusting God. You know, I, 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 can I have a few extra minutes today? It's cold outside. I promise you. Well, I know that some of us have an 11 o'clock appointment, but it'll be okay. Fear being abandoned. The fear of being abandoned. See, the fear of being left out there alone seems to motivate bearing the talent. Because you hear what he said, I knew you were harsh. I was afraid if I risked your money, you would reject me and abandon me. Because this guy was into false or artificial intimacy. If you're in true intimacy with someone, you don't fear abandonment. You know if you're in the right place, I may risk everything, but I'm still going to be accepted and loved. And so, the fear of being abandoned seems to motivate stuffing God in the mattress or burying the money. See, I, I'll tell you, there's so, certain people I just like to be with. I like to be with people who fight over the check. I don't like to go to lunch with someone who's waiting the other person out to see who's going to pay. Or the minute the bill comes, we spend 45 minutes figuring to the penny what everybody owes. I hate that. Oh, well, here's the great one. I've got to go to the bathroom now. The check just came. I feel an urge. No, I know this is going to upset some people who are watching it. But I like to hang around because I found out something. People who share everything they have have better connections. You know, this is something we, we don't have to preach. People who share what they have have better connections. My greatest joy in life, and I get this from my dad, God rest his soul, Francis E. Shell in the heavenly realm. My man loved to give. My man looked for reasons to give. 
And I learned giving from my dad. I watched my dad give when it made no sense to give. See, the Bible says when you hear rumors of wars and economies falling, you're not supposed to store up stuff. You're supposed to give stuff away. It shows who you trust. In fact, those who want to store up, this is why I love, this is terrible for me to say, but i got to say it. I love to agitate stingy people who hate to give to God's work. I just, there's something about it that just really gives me a lot of joy. I, I can't really tell you what it is, but I love it when I know they are reeling because I'm talking about money. You know why? Because God talks about it. Not because I want to agitate people, but it's like, get over it. It blows me away. When you start to change your perception, see, there's people who actually think a better job making a little more money is going to fix their life. What's going to fix our life is to let the life of God flow through us where we're at. See, I'll tell you what, you can despise your boss. I'm going to talk about connections now. You can despise your boss. Or you can say, I'm going to tell you what, boss, I'm going to ensure our success. Is God big enough for you to ensure their success without destroying you? No, the question is, is God big enough? Is God big enough to ensure their success? Because, see, I think God's economy. The rabbis taught something very funny about Scripture. He said Scripture was the economy of relationships and connections. Po people in poverty are the most greedy people on the face of the earth. A sign that you're greedy is you're in poverty. Because you can't outgive God. So when you are the person, it's nothing more beautiful <clears throat> than people arguing over who's going to get the blessing by giving. <laughs> That's what the kingdom of God is like. Is God big enough if I give extravagantly to something God wants to do? Is God big enough if I give to something God wants to do that he'll take care of me even if it doesn't look like he can? Is he that big? Is he that big? Is he big enough for me to be faithful over a little? And let me tell you what a little is. A tithe is a little. It's just a little so that he can make me rule over much. It isn't about the tithe per se. It's about, what, it's about who I trust. See, some of us trust the welfare department more than God. Some of us trust our jobs more than God. Okay. See, let me tell you, here's how you know, Lord have mercy, everybody said, Lord have mercy. The day you are no longer emotional about money is the day you're free. Yeah. No, when I, now Bob Crispin is a, is a carpenter. Wouldn't it look strange if Bob walked around with his hammer hugging and kissing it? Oh, Hammer, I love you, Hammer. Isn't my Hammer pretty? My little Hammer. Hammer is designed to do something. It's designed to drive nails into wood. It's nothing you get affectionate with. It's just a tool. <laughs> Sons of God do not work for money. Sons of God work to transfer the life of God through them. Sons of God do not work for mammon. They work to make connections with people. 
And if you're truly mature in God, you're making connections with a lot of people by which you're willing to share with a lot of people. That's what the kingdom of God is like. A lot of people I've given stuff to walked away. That wasn't my problem, that was their problem. Because they didn't understand what I shared with them was for the purpose of making a connection, not for the purpose of trying to control them. I told you it was going to be strange today. The day you lose your affection about money, you'll never be mad at your spouse because they don't make enough money or work hard enough. You'll be able to sit with the governor, the mayor, and even the president and sit next to a homeless person down by the, by downtown by Samaritan's house and be the same person. But the minute you start hoarding your time and hoarding your, your, your resources and hoarding the life of God for you, you have just entered damnation's door and darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. In other words, you can't see right when you're stingy or selfish. That's this darkness that was read out of Thessalonians. But with you, you're in the light. Your trust system is different. You trust a different dimension. Oh, this is so good. Huh? You know what? There are people who love money. And then there are people who love what money can do. The love of money is the root of all evil. I, I saw a homeless guy. This is strange. I had a strange conversation with a homeless guy. I have one church on my car. Gets me in a lot of trouble. Like I can't cut people off and flip them off and stuff like that. Because I have one church on my car. <laughs> you know, like you can't do that. So I'm at a stoplight downtown going to meet Alex for lunch. And this guy's holding this thing, God bless, God help. And I just stood there and I looked at him. He looked at me. And uh, he come up to my window and put it up next to my window like that. So I just looked at it. And I finally rolled down the window and I said, can I help you? And he said, uh, can I have a quarter for lunch? I said, you can't buy lunch with a quarter. I said, you'll need at least 10 bucks to buy lunch. And he said, I just want a quarter. I said, first of all, you don't want a quarter for lunch. If you want lunch, I said, I'll tell you what, I'm headed downtown. I'll go buy you a $30 lunch if you want it. Is that what you want? And I said, so I had five bucks in my little container there that I had sitting there. I said, I'll tell you what, this is number of grace. I'm going to give you $5. Go do with it whatever you want to do. I said, but I'm going to tell you something. Don't ever criticize the church or people who have money again. Because you'll criticize people who go after money, but you'll ask those people for their money. Well, that's how we are with the life of God. We're like a beggar on the corner saying, God, do something for me. We're, we're like homeless people on the corner, not letting the life of God flow. Do you see the picture yet? Do you see that God has put in you from before the foundation of the world a wealth of spiritual life that is supposed to be flowing out of you to make connections with people? For those of you that don't know it, that are on the web, we have a neighbor next year, a craft beer company who rents 10,500 square feet from us. I love these people. I have great connection with these people. Only religious people get hung up that a craft beer is next door. They don't get hung up that, that the Rocky, they can take their kids to a Rockies game and have beer spilled all over them when somebody hits a home run. But they're worried about that because they don't have a good economy. 
My prayer is, God, make them successful, God. God, what can I do? Can I go over there and help them? Can I give them some extra time? What can, what can we do as a community to bless these people? You need to find a gas station in your neighborhood or a little market where you go in and you tell the owner, you can depend on my business. I'm going to faithfully serve you that you can become successful. I'm going to buy all my gas here. When I come in, I want to say hi to you. I want to bless you with my presence. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. I'm going to be loyal and faithful to something outside of myself to help somebody else be successful. That's what the kingdom of God is like. And this is why most of us don't have time to disciple people because we're hoarding our family. We're hoarding our children. We're hoarding our money. We're hoarding our emotions. We don't have time to let the life of God flow out of us, away from us, in order to build a kingdom economy. This isn't about money in and of itself. It's about the life of God flowing through us. Can I get an amen here? Now, the tra tra tragedy, well, let me put it this way. We are challenged to not sit on the life of God in us. We're challenged to not sit on the life of God in us. Keep the oil in supply, living from the life of God and not sitting back in complacency on the basis of status or security. See, let me tell you something. How many of you work with somebody that's hard to work with? How many of you work with somebody that's trying to provoke you into misery? So the poverty says, get out of this. Poverty says, get, out of, get me out of this. But if you go up to that person and you start to affirm them with the fact that you're going to ensure their success, you can depend on me. I'll be there when everybody else won't try to drive through the snow. When everybody else is negative, I'll be the voice of positivity. You can't help but be blessed and promoted. No, I know, no, we, we want our rights protected now. Come on. I want my rights for nobody's going to abuse me. i got to put some boundaries up here. I'm here to tell you in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, take your boundaries away. And... Move into high-risk spirituality. Take a risk. I remember when we first looked at this building. It was empty. There were no walls. There was nothing here. Nothing. It was an empty building. You'd have to be insane to try to put a church here. But something unnatural. And to this day, I don't even know why. Something unnatural said do it. And all wise counsel, other pastors, you're crazy if you do that, man. We have people leave. That's a bad neighborhood. I'm not bringing my kids down there. I said, I'm sorry. I know we're supposed to do this. And we struggled over the years. I said, God, why do we struggle so much? He said, because of your perception. You're struggling because of the way you're looking at it, because you're not seeing it the way I see it. He said, when it has fulfilled its purpose, I'll give you something better. But will you ride it out long enough? See, it's what people do. They bail out of the process because God isn't big enough for them. They bail out of the process because God isn't big enough. Then they got to go somewhere else and justify why God wasn't big enough for them to commit to what they promised. So now because I can't commit to what I promised because God isn't big enough to fix anything I disagree with. 
Because here's what's going to happen. I told you all how the fathers looked at marriage and people who wanted, if a man or a woman lived with a spouse who was, who was an unbeliever and was, was uh, mean-spirited and not cooperative, the fathers say you have, there are three things that are going to happen. Have I shared this with you? There are three things that are going to happen in this marriage. It's the same way with friendships. It's the same way with ministry. Three things are going to happen. Number one, either you're going to find enough grace to live with the misery they try to cause. God's going to be big enough for you to stay faithful and loving in the midst of their inability or unwillingness to change. Number two is going to happen if that don't happen. You're going to die. And then number three, if that don't happen, they're going to die. There's your three alternatives. You'll have the grace to endure it, to glorify God, or one of you is going to die. Nowhere does it say you have an escape clause from your process. Is God big enough for you to stay faithful to something even if it looks like it's not working? That's the economy of God. But what we tend to do is go stuff God's money, stuff God in the mattress. I'm about done. I don't even have a watch anymore. God wanted that watch to fall off. I'm telling you right now. I'm going to go back to being old-time Pentecostal. God ripped my watch off so I could preach this as long as I wanted to do it. And you all ought to say amen. I'm just going to tell you right now, that was the Holy Ghost. Shondai, shoot a mosquito. Mama, my knee hurts me. God set me free on that one. Do you see what I'm saying? The tragedy is that many people are afraid of losing or endangering God from adventures. To resist attempts at radical inclusion of God in a process, they fear compromising God's purity or God's holiness. That becomes their excuse for not making connections by sharing. They're afraid they're going to endanger God's holiness or purity. They're afraid that God's not big enough to survive my attempt to, be at, to, to take a risk. Well, now, what if it fails? God will look bad. God's like, all oh, right. I'm, I suffer from low self-esteem. I'm worried about looking bad. Where he said in this peril, the guy who was afraid of looking bad is the one that was damned into darkness. Christianity is a high-risk call. It's taking unnatural risks. Is God big enough? I told you, Caleb, the name of the message is stop stuffing God in the mattress. But maybe we should just call it, is God big enough? See, because if he's not big enough, in your mind, only one thing can happen. Fear. I'll say that again because it's so deep, you have to have somebody help you misunderstand it. Only one thing's going to happen if God isn't big enough in an area of your life. You're going to fall into fear. And if you fall into fear, you're going to have to fall into compromise. Because compromise is the fruit of fear. The only person that's compromising anything is someone who's afraid. Because they're addicted to artificial intimacy. I don't have to lie to someone I have sincere intimacy with out of fear. I've, I know what that's like. I've been there. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but you all told your little white lies. We all tell them, at the root of every lie is a fear-based perception. That I, I've built this relationship on artificial intimacy, it's what we do. I've got I've to do this with you for you to love me. I've got to do something with you for you to stay loyal to me. Which is artificial intimacy. 
But true intimacy says you have the freedom to be naked as a jaybird with truth. And rather than criticize you, I will love you and help you get through what you're supposed to get through. It'll wear you and me out trying to keep someone loyal to us by having to do something for them. If I got to pay you to keep your loyalty, I have artificial intimacy with you. And I'm not talking about jobs. I'm talking about all kinds of relationships. Oh, I guess I'd have, I don't even know what time it is now. God is bigger than our religious industry. Sometimes we find God is pulling in great prophets in areas we had deemed beyond God's interests. Sometimes God is pulling in prophets in areas we don't even think God's in. <laughs> Sometimes God's doing something in something, our religious hang-ups. Sometimes God's answer to our cry is a high-risk decision to how big God can be. That's faith. How big is God? Is God big enough for you to love faithfully someone who has betrayed you? Can the life of God flow at that level? We've all betrayed and we've all been betrayed. Every one of us. Every one of us have been betrayed. and be But see, we reserve out of a carnal economy, a carnal economy to hold on the shelf the betrayal done to us and want the one we did put away. Well, that happened before I had, I don't care when it happened. It happened. The economy of God is like a man going on a journey and he gives his slaves, he gives his servant 5 million, 10 million, 25 million. And he comes back, he said, what have you done with the life of God I've given you? What have you done with the life of God? I know what you've done with your natural talents and I'm finishing here. We can all do stuff with our natural, with your natural ability, you can, you can make money. You can make money with natural ability. But it takes supernatural economy to let the life of God flow through you beyond the natural. We come here to liturgy today. It's unnatural to just repeat the same thing over and over. I hear, you know, I hear people say, well, you know, it just, I don't get anything out of it. That's your choice. That's your choice. We need to get a next generation squared away. We need to get, not everything our kids are supposed to do will they get something out of. Some things they're just supposed to do out of discipline. Just out of because you need to do it. Well, I don't get anything out of it. Well, I don't care. I'm training you to not be self-centered. I'm training you, there's some things you'll have to do in your life that are selfless. There's some things you have to commit to and be faithful to that don't feel like they stimulate you all the time. I believe this is why we have a drug-addicted society. Because we become obsessed with having stimulation all the time. That when it's time to become sober, as was read in the, to be sober and just say, hey, you know what? I got to wait for a while. Nothing's happening. I don't feel anything. I don't know what's going to happen. I just love you, God. Lord, have mercy. And in your time, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up on wings of eagles. But we don't know how to wait. Because we have to constantly be stimulated and entertained to be involved. In 
the minute, the minute we're asked to stay faithful to something that doesn't stimulate us or get us excited, we find out where our fears really are at. The fear of being abandoned to wait and trust God until he does what he's going to do. Stand to your feet, beloved. I don't know what more I can say today. All I'm saying is there's a different breed of Christian being raised up now. Listen closely. It is fascinating for Matthew to compare God to an entrepreneurial multimillionaire. Isn't that fascinating? Who's given 25 million to one, 10 million to another, 5 million to another. What are you doing with the life of God that you've been given? Stop putting God under the mattress. As we begin to trust, allowing God to move through us, our lives will change as individuals and our communities will have a better chance of change. There are rich pickings out there, so, and there is a harvest that is ripe. The harvest is gathered through sharing the life of God in us with others. Close your eyes for a minute. Who is it? Where is it? When is it? What is the most extravagant, the most bizarre, the most unfathomable act of letting the God, God flow through you that you could do? Then that next question is, the unwillingness to trust God to do it reveals our fears of abandonment. Father, I bless your people now as we get ready to partake of these divine mysteries. May we not only believe in you, but may we trust in you. May we trust in you in a way we've never trusted you before. May we be found good and worthy servants. Father, help us. Help us be delivered from artificial intimacy with each other and with you. Identify to us, Lord, the areas we've built isolated walls around ourselves. Out of the fear that you're not big enough, you're not big enough to intervene in our life. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. We believe in one God. The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and...